The middle class isn't vanishing by accident. It's disappearing by design. The numbers prove it. Since the 1970s, wages have stagnated while productivity has skyrocketed. Corporate profits hit record highs, but workers' share of income keeps shrinking. This isn't a theory, it's arithmetic. Every year, inflation quietly steals your purchasing power and the cost of living rises faster than your paycheck. Meanwhile, the richest 1% now own more wealth than the entire middle class combined. The economy's math no longer adds up for ordinary people. Before we break down the numbers, take a second to subscribe. It helps more people understand what's really happening. Also, tell me in the comments which country you are watching from and what time it is where you are. Let's see how global this problem really is. The story starts with a promise. After World War II, the industrialized world built the idea of the middle class dream. A home, a car, a stable job, and savings for the future. From 1945 to 1973, real wages doubled in many developed countries. One income could support an entire family. But something changed in the 1970s. The dollar was decoupled from gold, inflation began to rise, and productivity gains stopped translating into higher pay. In the United States, from 1973 to now, Worker productivity rose by more than 250%, but hourly compensation rose by less than 15%. The gap between what workers produced and what they earned became a canyon. This shift wasn't random. Governments and corporations restructured how value flows through the economy. Instead of sharing gains with workers, profits were redirected to shareholders. CEO pay exploded. In 1965, the average CEO made about 20 times the salary of an average worker. Today, that number is over 350. That's not capitalism working. That's extraction disguised as growth. Now layer on debt. When real wages stop growing, the only way for people to maintain their living standards is to borrow. Credit cards, auto loans, student loans, mortgages. The middle class didn't lose its lifestyle overnight. It mortgaged it. Debt became the substitute for income. In 1970, total household debt in the US was around $500 billion. Today, it's over $17 trillion. Every major purchase now depends on financing. The system made consumers dependent on credit while telling them they were free. Inflation quietly made the problem worse. Over the last 50 years, the cost of essentials, housing, healthcare, and education there has risen far faster than official inflation statistics suggest. A college education that cost $1,000 in 1970 now costs over $20,000 per year. Taxes also play a part. The top marginal tax rate in the 1950s was over 90%. Today, it's 37%, but effective tax loopholes make it far lower for the wealthy. The result? The tax burden shifted downward. Payroll taxes, consumption taxes, and hidden inflation taxes hit ordinary workers harder. The rich make their income from capital gains, dividends, and stock buybacks, which are taxed less than wages. The system mathematically funnels wealth upward. Meanwhile, the cost of money itself, interest rates, shapes who benefits most, when rates are low, the wealthy can borrow cheap money to buy assets, stocks, real estate, private equity. These assets rise in value, creating more wealth. But when rates rise, as they have recently, the middle class gets squeezed. Mortgage rates climb, credit card interest hits 25%. The debt that once sustained the middle class now crushes it. Automation and globalization added another layer. Companies offshored labor to cheaper countries and replaced domestic workers with machines. The gains went to investors, the costs hit wage earners. A factory worker who once made $30 an hour was replaced by a robot or an overseas worker making $3. The result was a deflation in wages, but inflation in everything else. The final piece is asset inflation. The middle class saves in cash, the rich save in assets. Since 2008, central banks printed over $30 trillion globally. That money didn't go into wages or small businesses. It went into the stock market, real estate and bonds owned, all owned mostly by the wealthy. The top 10% of households now own 89% of U.S. stocks. The middle class holds 6%. So when asset prices go up, the rich get richer by billions while the middle class barely keeps up with rent. This isn't a conspiracy. It's the inevitable result of compounding inequality. The system rewards capital and penalizes labor. As long as that equation stands, the middle class can't grow, it can only shrink. Every paycheck, tax, and interest payment you make feeds into this structure. The proof is in the numbers. Between 1971 and today, the share of national income going to the middle, 60% of earners, dropped from 62% to 42%. The top 1% share doubled. Median household income, adjusted for inflation, has barely moved in 50 years, while the cost of living nearly tripled. Mathematically, the middle class is being divided into two groups, those who own assets and those who rent them. So what happens next? Some economists argue this cycle ends when debt saturation hits, when households can no longer borrow more. 
Others believe it ends with currency debasement, as governments print to cover their obligations. Either way, the numbers don't lie. The current system is not sustainable. This is only the beginning of the story. Do you think the middle class can recover? Or is this the end of it as we know it? Tell me in the comments. I read them all. The disappearance of the middle class didn't happen overnight. It's been a slow, calculated erosion hidden behind financial jargon, policy shifts, and consumer distraction. Governments told citizens that home ownership, stock investing, and retirement accounts would keep them secure. But in practice, those same systems turned ordinary people into collateral for a debt-driven economy. When you peel back the numbers, you find that the very tools meant to build wealth now serve to extract it. Take housing. For decades, it's been sold as the foundation of middle-class wealth. But housing markets are no longer about homes, they're about assets. In 1980, the average home cost three times the median income. Today, it's more than seven times. Wages didn't rise, credit did. Mortgages expanded from 20-year to 30-year terms, then to adjustable rate and interest-only loans. Banks learned to profit more from debt than from affordability. And when housing prices rise, it doesn't make life better for new buyers. It traps them in decades of repayment. The American dream quietly became a 30-year financial contract. Now consider the stock market. After the 2008 crisis, central banks injected trillions into the system through quantitative easing. That liquidity inflated asset prices to record highs. The S&P 500 tripled in value between 2009 and 2021. But who benefited? The top 10% of Americans own almost 90% of stocks. For everyone else, 401ks and pensions barely keep pace with inflation. The wealth effect is an illusion. When markets fall, ordinary workers lose retirement savings while billionaires buy the dip. Meanwhile, corporate behavior changed. Companies stopped reinvesting in employees or innovation. Instead, they focused on buybacks, repurchasing their own shares to inflate stock prices. In 2022 alone, U.S. corporations spent over $900 billion on buybacks, while median wages barely rose 4%. The math is clear. Every dollar that boosts stock value is a dollar not spent on workers. This is why the middle class feels poor even during economic booms. The wealth is being measured in market capitalization, not in purchasing power. Technology was supposed to level the playing field, but it amplified inequality. Gig work replaced stable employment. Contract jobs without benefits or security became the norm. The average Uber driver or DoorDash courier earns less than minimum wage after expenses. Platforms call them independent partners, but they hold no leverage, no pension, and no protection. The digital economy converted labor into disposable input. The worker became an algorithmic variable in a profit equation. Education used to be the ladder to upward mobility. Now it's the anchor of debt. The U.S. student loan balance is over $1.7 trillion. Tuition rose more than 400% since the 1980s, far outpacing wage growth. A generation was told, get a degree to get ahead. Instead, they entered the workforce already underwater. The irony? Many degrees no longer guarantee high-paying jobs. The credential inflation trap means you need more education to earn the same income your parents did with less. Healthcare follows the same logic. Costs have exploded while real outcomes barely improved. In 1980, U.S. healthcare spending was about 9% of GDP. Today, it's 18%. Families pay more but get less, higher premiums, bigger deductibles, and less coverage. The system converts illness into profit. Middle-class households spend nearly 20% of income on healthcare-related costs. That's not sustainable. All these pressures converge into a single reality. The middle class no longer owns its future. Savings rates are near record lows. Nearly 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Even in Europe and Asia, the trend repeats. Stagnant wages, rising living costs, and asset inflation. The mathematical balance of the economy has shifted so far toward capital that labor has become a secondary force. The psychological toll is immense. Anxiety, burnout, and financial insecurity define the modern middle class. Surveys show over 70% of adults feel financially trapped. They work harder, longer, yet fall further behind. And as automation continues to advance, even skilled professionals face obsolescence. Artificial intelligence, once seen as a productivity tool, is now a cost-cutting weapon. Every algorithm replaces a paycheck. What makes this cycle dangerous is how invisible it feels day to day. Most people still believe they're financially average, not realizing that the definition of middle has shifted dramatically. In 1971, a single income could support a family, own a home, and save for retirement. Today, dual-income households struggle to afford rent, childcare, and health care simultaneously. The math doesn't work, and no amount of budgeting advice can fix structural imbalance. So what's driving this? The answer lies in the monetary system itself. Since the end of the gold standard, money creation has become debt creation. Every dollar is issued as a liability borrowed into existence by governments, corporations, or individuals. To grow the economy, debt must always expand. 
but wages don't grow at the same rate, which means debt compounds faster than income. The result? Perpetual inflation and shrinking purchasing power. The average dollar now buys 85% less than it did in 1970. Meanwhile, central banks aim for controlled inflation to stimulate spending. But what they call 2% inflation is actually a silent tax on savings. At that rate, the value of your money halves every 35 years. The rich avoid this by owning assets that inflate in value. The middle class can't because their income barely covers expenses. Over time, inflation acts as a transfer mechanism, moving wealth from savers to asset holders. That's the structural design of modern capitalism, growth through credit expansion. It rewards risk-taking with borrowed money and punishes those who live within their means. The more debt you can leverage, the more access you have to growth. The middle class, unable or unwilling to take that risk, gets left behind. Yet there's a deeper consequence. When inequality grows beyond a threshold, societies fracture. History shows this repeatedly, from the collapse of the Roman Republic to the revolutions of the 18th century. When the economic middle erodes, polarization replaces stability, politics become extreme, social trust declines, and institutions lose legitimacy. The numbers are already signaling this pattern. In the US, trust in government and media has fallen below 25%. Civil unrest and populist movements rise in response to economic despair. If the math continues, the next generation won't have a middle class in the traditional sense. It will have two groups, asset owners and income earners, landlords and tenants. The same pattern once seen in feudal systems is quietly re-emerging under the banner of progress. Before we move into the final part of this story, think about your own situation. How much of your income goes to interest, taxes, or rent? How much do you actually keep? That's the measure of economic freedom. Not how much you earn, but how much you retain. Let's imagine a future where this trend continues, where inequality widens, and the middle class becomes a historical concept. What happens then? Economically, the system becomes unstable. The middle class isn't just a social category, it's the engine of consumption, productivity, and innovation. Without it, capitalism loses its balance. Demand weakens, political unrest rises, and financial bubbles become the only way to sustain growth. But bubbles always burst, and when they do, the fallout hits the same group every time, the people who can least afford it. Here's the paradox. The system needs the middle class to survive, but its current design erodes it. Governments respond to crises, recessions, pandemics, wars, by printing money. That keeps the economy afloat in the short term, but deepens inequality over time. Every round of stimulus flows first to financial markets, then trickles down to consumers through higher prices. That's not stimulus, it's redistribution in disguise. Let's look at the most recent example. During the 2020 pandemic, global governments injected over $20 trillion into their economies. Stock markets soared, luxury goods boomed, and billionaires added over $5 trillion to their net worth. Meanwhile, small businesses closed at record rates, wages stagnated, and inflation hit 40-year highs. The middle class was told they were being helped, but their purchasing power collapsed. By 2023, an average family was paying 25% more for the same groceries and utilities as two years earlier. But inflation isn't just a random phenomenon, it's a mathematical certainty in a debt-based system. Every dollar created must be paid back with interest, meaning the total debt always exceeds the money supply. To service that debt, new money must be created, which reduces the value of existing money. It's a treadmill that never stops. Those closest to money creation, banks, corporations, asset managers, get richer. Those furthest from it, wage earners, get poor. This is known as the Cantillon effect, named after an 18th century economist who first described it. When new money enters the economy, it doesn't affect everyone equally. The first recipients, usually governments and financial institutions, spend it before prices rise. By the time it reaches the average consumer, inflation has already devalued it. It's a built-in wealth transfer mechanism hidden inside monetary policy. And this is why the middle class is mathematically doomed in the current system, because the rules are written to favor capital over labor. The rich don't work for money. They own assets that multiply it. The poor and middle class trade time for wages that depreciate. In 1970, a single income could buy a home, a car, and raise two kids. Today, two incomes barely cover essentials. And yet, productivity has more than doubled since then. So where did that value go? Straight up the ladder into corporate profits, executive bonuses, and shareholder returns. To understand how we got here, you have to see how the economic narrative was rewritten over the last century. In the mid-20th century, Keynesian economics dominated policy. Governments were expected to manage demand, stimulate growth, and protect employment. But by the 1980s, neoliberalism took over. The market, we were told, was self-correcting. Deregulation, privatization, and globalization became the new religion. Taxes on the wealthy dropped. 
Unions weakened and public safety nets eroded. For a while, it seemed to work. Cheap credit, cheap imports, and technological growth made life comfortable. But beneath that comfort was decay. Wages flattened, job security disappeared, and the cost of living exploded. The middle class, lulled by easy access to debt, didn't notice they were financing their own decline. The credit card became a lifeline and a trap. By 2025, U.S. household debt surpassed $18 trillion. That's more than the GDP of China. The average American now owes over $100,000 in combined mortgages, car loans, and credit cards. The illusion of prosperity is maintained not by income, but by leverage. You can still afford the lifestyle as long as you keep borrowing. But that's not wealth. It's dependence. And this dependence is strategic. A population in debt is a population under control. If you owe, you comply. You keep working, keep paying, keep hoping. You're too busy managing bills to challenge the system. That's the quiet brilliance of modern finance. It replaces chains with credit. The middle class doesn't realize it's trapped because the prison looks like freedom. The system even rewards this behavior. Credit scores, loan approvals, and mortgage eligibility are presented as marks of responsibility. But they're really measures of obedience, how reliably you feed the machine. Those who don't participate are penalized. Try living without a credit card or loan in today's world and you're instantly marginalized. But there's a breaking point. When inequality grows too wide, the system becomes unsustainable. Economists call it the inequality trap. Once wealth concentration exceeds a certain level, economic mobility collapses. The rich use their influence to shape laws, suppress competition, and monopolize opportunity. This isn't a conspiracy. It's a feedback loop. The more wealth you control, the easier it becomes to control the system that creates it. We're already there. The top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90% combined. And when that happens, democracy itself begins to erode. Because money doesn't just buy assets, it buys power. Policies no longer reflect the will of the people, but the interests of donors and corporations. The middle class becomes politically invisible. Yet despite all this, there's still a way forward. But it starts with awareness. Understanding the math is the first step to escaping it. That means recognizing that true wealth isn't your salary, it's your autonomy. It's the ability to control your time, your debt, and your decisions. The system thrives on financial dependency. Breaking free means rewiring how you think about money. Instead of chasing income, focus on ownership, even small stakes, in businesses, digital assets, or real property can compound over time. Learn the language of money because it's the only universal language of power. Inflation, interest, and leverage aren't just economic terms, they're control mechanisms. The less you understand them, the more you're controlled by them. As we close this story, remember, the disappearance of the middle class isn't inevitable, it's mathematical, and math can be rewritten. The question is whether society will do it collectively or whether individuals will have to adapt alone. History shows that when inequality hits critical mass, change follows, either through reform or through collapse. The choice between the two is being made right now in every paycheck, every policy, every dollar printed. And if you want to know where it all leads, follow the math, because the math never lies.